Hi everyone, welcome back to the channel. Today I'm delighted to be joined by Melissa Maris from Raw Food Romance. And today we're going to be talking about her journey, her tips, and the amazing power of raw foods. Now, Liz has been on a raw vegan diet for over 10 years now, which is amazing. And not only that, <laughs> I'm not sure if you guys would have seen her recipes, things like the wraps, um, they just look amazing. I'll put on screen now just so you can see it visually. But yeah, um, Lisa, how did you how did you find a raw vegan diet and lifestyle? And yeah, why do you even choose to eat this way? Because for a lot of people, it's like vegans crazy enough. <laughs> so yeah, how did you how did you find out about the lifestyle? Awesome. Well, first of all, thank you for inviting me on. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, so I discovered raw food. It would be roughly around 2004, so 20 years ago now as of, as of this recording. Um, but I didn't really like dive right in. I kind of dabbled in it a little bit. I was working at a natural health food store, and I used to work at like an organic grocery store kind of thing. So I already had a lot of knowledge about health and herbs and supplements and you know the importance of eating properly, even though I didn't back then in my early 20s. But I decided that I was going to try a little bit of raw here and there. And I found some books, you know, and the 2006 was when, um, a, a couple extra, you know, raw books came out on the market. So I'd be like, Oh yeah, raw food. And I'd look into it and I'd try a little bit, but at the time it was mostly what I was exposed to was mostly a high fat way of raw. And I was also working in the industry, the health industry, which also unfortunately promoted a lot of diet culture ideas like cutting severely cutting calories or skipping meals um you know distracting yourself from your cravings instead of fueling up there was a lot of stuff and being scared of fruit was another one being obsessed with fats and oils was another one so it was really hard to be in that world and you know want to eat a raw diet. So whenever I would do raw diet it would always be like really high fat. I'd have like one, two, three avocados a day sometimes. And I ate very little greens, hardly any fruit because I was scared of the fruit sugar. Um, and then I would always fall off or I'd get cravings and go back. And, and that went on for about 10 years. So from 2004 to 2014, I would go off and on raw. I did other diets. I did lots of cleanses and detoxes and all that kind of stuff because I was exposed to it all. I had like access to inexpensive stuff because I could get it at wholesale pricing. And, you know, there was just like a lot of stuff that went on in those 10 years. But I always resonated with the idea of raw food because it was just the way nature made it. So in 2014, actually we'll back up maybe about a year. In 2013, I did like a challenge at the gym and I wanted to do raw, but my personal trainer wasn't really too keen on that. And so I was following kind of like a severely restrictive diet and I had to write my journal. It was a challenge. So I was going, you know, to see her two, three times a week. I was going almost every day except rest days. And I was trying to have like the best transformation or whatever. And in my journal, I was eating like some days 800 to 1200 calories, like very, very, very severely calorie restricting. And she would check it off and she'd be like, this is great. Oh my gosh, you're doing so good. And so, you know, here I thought I was doing great. And then after that, after that gym challenge, I had restricted myself so much to the point that my body was just like, I want everything and anything. So mm -hmm. I fell off and I went on like probably the worst food intake of my life, even though I wasn't always like that great anyways, it was like everything in moderation and, you know, weekend treats and pizza nights and whatever. And then I would eat healthy on some days. Sometimes I'd go raw for a week or two or three days, or I think the longest I went was about two months, but I would always go back to eating all these other foods because of social issues or cravings or what have you. But that, like, I would say it was around eight months I was just, I was eating everything and anything that was just, I knew better. <laughs> like, you know, a bag of Doritos for breakfast, lots of junk food, tons of animal products. Um, you know, my token vegetable, I would have like three or four sprigs of asparagus with my animal products, you know, because I didn't get any in during the day. Um, 
so after that, I was also doing one to two energy drinks a day plus coffees. I was really, really not eating properly. And I was experiencing a lot of health issues. And I had experienced health issues from when I was in my late teens, early 20s. And I had severe cystic acne all over my face, and that got worse. I had joint pain, and that got worse. I had irregular periods from right when I was like in my early teens. Those were way unbalanced. I had brain fog and severe gut dysbiosis. Like I had dealt with candida from, I was diagnosed at about 19 with um, candida overgrowth. So that's why I got into the health industry in the first place, because I was really interested in healing this gut dysbiosis that I had. And I did like the bentonite clay cleanse. I did juice fasts. I did a water fast. I did cleanse kits galore, like tons of like the herbs that supposed to kill the yeast. And I did probiotics. I did all of the stuff, but I never changed the foundation of what I was putting in my body every day. And I would still go back and I would do cheat days or whatever, like all of the justifications that we have. So I dealt with the candida overgrowth from age 19 till about 34, 35 after I went raw. And it was raw food that actually was the key to getting rid of my candida. And I didn't have to do anything. All I had to do was eat fiber, eat variety, eat in abundance. And that just leveled itself on its own because I was building my microbiome and my microbiome fought off the yeast for me. So it was a really interesting journey. And yeah, in 2014, I was having these heart flutters in the middle of the night, most nights, and it felt like I was having a heart attack. So I'd wake up and then I wouldn't be able to get back to sleep because I'd imagine like, what would it be like if I died? And then I'm like 34, right? But I'm, I have all these health issues and everything. So the next day on September 12th, I woke up and I was like, that's it. I'm changing. I'm going back to raw because that made the most sense always. But I was like, why am I not able to stick to it? So I started digging, watching YouTubes and everything. And I came across a YouTube video and somebody, somebody made in the comments, they were like, watch Earthlings, Forks Over Knives and Cowspiracy. And I think Cowspiracy had just been released. It was like a brand new movie. And they're like, watch those three things and you'll be vegan. And I had never had the vegan connection the entire time from 2004 until 2014. I was just more into the raw aspect. Um, but then after I watched those three movies, I was immediately vegan. I was vegan through and through, never going to eat an an another animal product as long as I lived. And then I just defaulted back to raw because that made sense. And I assumed at the time, you know, most vegans ate a lot of raw food anyways. So I figured, you know, I'll just go raw. And from then I learned about low fat. I'd never done a low fat version of a raw diet. I was always super high fat. So I, I was like, I'm going to try doing a low fat diet and I'm going to try eating an abundance of fresh produce because I hadn't done that either. And it was so easy. It was so easy to do. After um, like four or five months, my skin stopped breaking out in cysts. Finally, for like the first time in my life, it stopped. And then my, my hormones balanced around like the seven or eight month mark. My brain fog went away. My gut dysbiosis went away. Like I would have sometimes either a cold or a flu or a bladder infection every two months um, in my late twenties and early thirties, like it was horrible. I was always sick and you know, those went away and I was like, this is amazing. <laughs> so I also lost weight, which was a bonus for me cause I needed to. And it was just, it was just wonderful. So that's kind of uh, long story short, <laughs> my story. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Awesome. And just for anyone who's wondering how much weight did you lose? Um, <clears throat> I lost 70 pounds. Um, in the first wow. year and a half of raw. Yeah. Mm, awesome. And what was it that like resonated with you about raw? Like how, how was it that you knew mm -hmm. that kind of raw was the way, were, were there any influences or books or like, yeah, what, what made mm -hmm. you want to even like do it? Yes. At the time, um, like around, I think it was 2006, it was sun food diet. Um, that book that really, it was like beautifully written. Um, and I know there's some issues with it, but we'll, we'll just push that aside for now. But, um, you know, just the information itself was really beautiful. And I really resonated with the idea that it's energetically active food. It's real food. It's the food mm. that is grown for us. And, um, you know, animals don't have to die 
for it and we don't have to cook it. <laughs> I was like, I, you know, I made food. I cooked food. I would do recipes and stuff back in the day. But the idea of not having to cook and not having to like wait for uh, like everything to be done at the same time, that was the thing I hated most about cooking was like, okay, well, if I, if I start the rice now, you know, like trying to plan out the meal, uh, I was like, I can just make a salad. That's amazing. I can just blend a smoothie. And then after I started exploring different ways of playing with raw food, I found a blossom of recipe creation. That was something that I was like totally drawn towards. And that's how I, you know, um, came up with all these recipes and everything because I wanted to play with my food finally. I just really didn't enjoy the cooking process for me, um, but I enjoyed the raw food prep uh, process. So it was really fun, but yeah, it just resonated with like the energetic power, the enzymatic activity, the realness of it, l the livingness of it, how easy it was to clean up after as well, how colorful it was and how hydrating it was. It was just all of those things that kind of really attracted me over to raw food. Mm. Yeah. A hundred percent. It makes sense on so many different levels, like the ethical, mm -hmm. the physiological, like, yeah, just all the all the uh, points you touched on there. Um, but when you actually like initially transitioned, did you experience like any detox symptoms mm. or or did you like instantly feel better? If you can remember, I know it's quite a while now. But. <laughs> yeah, a decade ago. <laughs> um, I do remember actually. Uh, it was really interesting because at the time, I didn't necessarily realize what was happening until I looked back um, years later and all the knowledge that I had acquired on the process of detox. So I was always taught in the supplement industry, it gets worse before it gets better and you have to go through detox and it's going to be painful and it's going to be this and it's going to be that. But one thing that I do really appreciate about what I learned in the supplement industry is that if you do a detox, you need fiber and it's like, that's like universally known, um, that if you do any kind of detox, you have to supplement with fiber even more than what you're eating because the fiber not only feeds your microbiome, but it also traps toxins. And it, it's kind of like, think of it as a bus escort system, right? When you have more fiber, it can escort the toxins out. And I learned this was before I was raw or, or anything. I learned that something called auto intoxication, where if a person goes on a cleanse or a fast and they're not supplementing with fiber, they can have severe detox symptoms because the, the toxins aren't actually really leaving their body. They're just recirculating. So they feel mm. like crap. Um, but when they start adding fiber, uh, it will facilitate the detox and help to pull those toxins out of the body because we have these elimination pathways for a reason, but they need to be supported. And also now I've learned too over the years that the phase two liver detox and cellular detox require glutathione to function properly. So if we really want to detox, we got to get glutathione created in our bodies and cruciferous vegetables are very high in everything we need to make glutathione. So they're known as liver detox supporters. So when I went raw, I was living in Canada and everything was very expensive. Tropical fruit was very, very expensive. And I defaulted to more greens and sprouts and things like that, along with the fruit. So I did still eat a lot of fruit, but I ate a little bit more greens and vegetables and stuff like that. And I believe, this is just my personal opinion based on everything I know, I believe that I was consuming such a high amount of fiber, like 80 plus grams of fiber a day, and that facilitated my detox, and I didn't have any classic detox symptoms. I maybe had cravings, which is normal because, you know, you're moving from one habit to another. You're going to have these habitual, like, you know, patterns that you deal with. Uh, but as for detox, like, you know, the headaches and all of that, I didn't have any of that. I just, you know, was making sure that I was eating enough. That's another thing that I've noticed too, is people will have symptoms 
and they claim it to be detox, but they're actually having under eating symptoms. And this is super, super, super common. Like, you know, the headaches, the lethargy and all this, they're like, oh, I'm detoxing. But it's actually because they're not eating enough. And as soon as they start eating enough, they start feeling better, but they're also getting more fiber in. So the fiber's trapping the toxins. Like it all works together. So all we really have to do, I believe, is support our bodies through the detox process by giving it what it needs. And we detox 24 seven anyways. So, um, th- that's just my theory of why I didn't have any of those symptoms. And I just went right into the healing process and, and it was just a lovely experience. <laughs> it's just me. Don't worry. We'll be back to the episode in a minute, but I just wanted to quickly share that if you do want to thrive on a raw vegan diet and you want to avoid a lot of the mistakes that I made early on, and you want to get your questions answered and be around like a like-minded tribe of supportive people, um, then you're very welcome inside my free community. If you're looking to lose weight, put on lean muscle, and you just generally want to have more energy, like less brain fog, just more fun in life, then I'd love to see you inside. And I'll leave that top link in the description. But anyway, I'll leave you to the rest of the conversation. Lissa shares tons of more insights. And yeah, peace and love. Mm. Yeah, awesome. <clears throat> I think, yeah, I think, like you say, under eating is, is huge. Mm-hmm. Like, I did it at the start. A lot of people do it at the start because your stomach capacity and like elasticity yes. hasn't like adapted fully. And yeah, I, f- I found it interesting what you said about the fiber as well. Um, mm-hmm. Cause I was, my mind was just going to like juice cleanses and water mm-hmm. fasting because I've interviewed like people who have done like extended juice fast. Some have taken like psyllium husk and bentonite mm-hmm. clay as well. And others haven't. So do you think, do you, would you say, yeah, I, I'm just wondering. So, you were saying there that the the detox symptoms are actually the toxins that aren't fully leaving the body. So it if, can if, be, yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So is the, uh, like the husk and the uh, clay, is that kind of like a way of getting stuff out mm-hmm. more? It can be, yeah, for sure. Um, I mean, I personally, I've done the fasts in the past and it's honestly, like my experience with just moving over to whole food raw was way more powerful and way more supportive to the body. And I mean, in my experience, um, I've spoken with hundreds, if not thousands by now of people who are a little worse off after their juice fasts. Um, like they feel amazing while they're on it because, you know, they've eliminated anything Mm. that could be, um, you know, causing any issues or what have you. So they feel amazing. They're finally hydrated. Uh, maybe they're coming from a very low fiber diet and now they're, they're consuming a little bit of fiber in terms of soluble fiber, which is more beneficial for the bacteria, not necessarily as that trapping in um, action because we need insoluble fiber mostly for that. So they feel great and they feel finally light and clear because they're not consuming these other foods. But then after the fact, and and this happens time and time again, and I think it's because I do talk about the the risks and the downsides because there are, you know, some positives there too. And I'm not anti-juice, you know, have a juice once in a while along with your whole food raw diet. But I have too many people message me and they're like, oh, like, you know, like now it's even worse or I have these new symptoms or I can't digest food. That's a big one. Um, They just can't digest food. So they, you know, they continue to restrict, they continue to limit. And then eventually a common thread among those people who consistently do the long juice fast is they end up going back to animal products. So, you know, it's just a pattern, obviously not a cause or, you know, the reason, but it is a pattern that, you know, I notice and many others notice it too. So it's just something that I caution to really make sure that you're supervised, like True North. Um, that's probably one of the better places to go if you're looking to do something like that. Um, you know, and, and make sure that your body is ready because a lot of people will go into it with already issues. Like, they're already depleted in a lot of things and this can actually make things worse um after time so yeah i i do think that adding fiber is a good idea the psyllium husk however is more insoluble than it is soluble uh sorry soluble psyllium husk is more soluble than it is insoluble so it does bulk up and it does trap toxins so that's good but that's why I think like whole foods, get those greens in, get those veggies in, um, you know, along with your fruit, have a nice balance and, and eat, eat adequate calories. 
Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Because we're in it for the long game. Like yourself, you've exactly. been doing it a decade. Like mm-hmm. we, we want to see where we're at in years down down the line. Yes. Like it's it's one thing losing weight like rapidly, but yeah, mm. it's, you see it all the time with fads and crash dieting and like carnival. Mm. Like some people go on carnival mm. in short term, like you say, because they're taking a break yes. from like those foods. They feel good, but yeah, it's the longevity. Mm-hmm. And, mm-hmm. and I like um, you talk about like the gut microbiome and building that up a lot in your content. Mm-hmm. So like, yeah, how does one build up their gut microbiome? And like, yeah, how does that work? Yeah, so our gut microbiome, for those who may not know, is also known as the forgotten organ. And studies have just recently over the last five, six-ish years have started to really come out about the microbiome and how important it is. So the microbiome is a group of the bacteria. There's like, I don't even remember, like 38 trillion bacteria. There's actually more of them in our guts than there are cells of our body. So they're super important. And when we want to nourish our body, we want to nourish them too, because they are part of our body and their food source is whole fiber. So they eat the soluble fiber and they do digest the insoluble fiber and there's stuff in insoluble fiber, the rough, you know, the, the pulp that people throw away, there's stuff in the pulp that you only get when it's fermented in your gut. So the bacteria eat it like polyphenols, for example, Uh, if you want those antioxidants, you got to eat the whole fiber because they're in the insoluble fiber. They're not in the the juice part. Well, I mean, there's probably some, but obviously like most of it's inside the fiber. So we want to digest that and get those benefits. So the probiotics, they're the living organized organisms within our gut, and they produce something called postbiotics, things that we need to stay healthy. Like for example, they create B12 for us. They convert K1 into K2, which is essential for bones, teeth, you know, hair, nails, that kind of thing, Um, and other body processes as well. But most importantly, they create short-chain fatty acids, which are extremely anti-inflammatory, anti-cancer. They feed our colon cells. The, uh, The acids feed our colon cells, and they actually help our colon cells to heal leaky gut. So if you have like allergies and things like building your gut can actually help you to heal up that leaky gut and everything. But you've got three things in the gut. You've got the prebiotics, the post or the probiotics and the postbiotics. The prebiotics are the fiber. That's the food that they eat. So inulin and fructoligosaccharides and all of, all of the fiber, anything that's fiber will feed these guys. And if different fibers feed different colonies, which is why they recommend to consume variety. So studies are showing that people who eat the most variety, meaning over 30 different plants every week, have the strongest microbiomes. So Nate and I eat, you know, we eat anywhere from 50 to 80 plus different varieties of plants every week. And it's just natural. Like we don't try, we're not obsessed with like, you know, having to, we don't do it out of fear. We just naturally eat a lot of variety because we value variety. So our salads have like tons of stuff in it, you know, small amounts of broccoli and we've got endive and radicchio and two, two or three different kinds of greens and sprouts and microgreens and all of tomatoes and cucumbers. We we try to fit everything we can into our salads. And so then you have the postbiotics, which I explained were the beneficial things that the probiotics create from the prebiotics. So to build the gut, we need to consume fiber. And the best way to consume that is in from whole plant foods. And raw obviously is what we choose. Um, you, go high raw, but also increasing variety. So if somebody has a kind of, um, gut issues with certain plants and they're coming from a very low fiber diet, for example, something high in animal products or very high in ultra processed foods, or even a vegan diet that's high in ultra processed foods. And it's a very low fiber diet or they're not eating enough. If you're not eating enough, you're not getting enough protein, you're not getting enough fiber, you're not getting enough nutrients at all over across the board. So if you're not eating enough, you're also on a low fiber diet because you're not consuming as much. So if you're coming from a low fiber diet and you jump into a raw diet, that's like 60 or 80 grams of fiber in a day, it can be very uncomfortable 
because your gut is weak. It's not the plants that are causing the problem. It's the fact that your gut is just not ready for it. But the good news is you can grow your gut. It just takes time. It takes patience. It takes consistency and it takes variety. So when you start, start with what feels good for you, like what you you say a big salad with iceberg lettuce, tomatoes, and cucumbers feels good right now. And that's really all you can handle for your gut. Add one little broccoli floret, like one little tree, tiny little one, maybe a tablespoon or two chopped in your salad and do that more consistently until you feel okay with maybe increasing it to two. And then once you're okay with two, then add a new variety to that, right? So you've got your broccoli and then you've got maybe a tablespoon of cabbage that you chop up and add to your salad. So you've got the broccoli and the cabbage in your salad. And then when that feels good, you could increase the cabbage a little bit, or you could add sprouts, lentil sprouts or something, just a tablespoon. Just start with small, small, small amounts. And I learned this from Dr. Will Bolsewicz, who wrote Fiber Fueled, so I wanted to give him credit for that, um, because that's really changed our gut microbiomes, and we test our microbiomes um, just for fun, because we want to see what's going on in our body. We're really interested to see what the food does inside, right? And when we started testing in 2021, um, my gut test and Nate's, we we had the very, very, very similar scores. It was 83% when we first tested. And then we tested again six months later, and then six months later, and then six months later, and then, you know, it was 91% for a little while, and it was 93% for a little while, and then after the wraps, now it's over 96% out of 100 for overall score. So we've really increased over the last three to four years our microbiomes because we increased our fiber variety and we added more things to our raw diet that... Um, we weren't doing before. For example, the wraps. <laughs> the wraps are extremely amazing gut foods because they have the psyllium husk. And psyllium, because it's a, um, a really great fiber, it feeds roseburia bacteria, which creates butyric acid or butyrate. And that's one of the uh, short chain fatty acids that's extremely anti inflammatory and anti cancer, very beneficial. So Uh, we're feeding those guys and they're producing more of it for us. And it's just a a beautiful symbiotic relationship. So yeah, that's um, a little story about the microbiome and we're, we're just really excited and happy to explore and play with it and have fun. (laughs) Yeah, I can tell you're definitely passionate about it and it's good. It, it comes across well. And have you personally like noticed um, since your test scores like improved, have you felt Mm -hmm. any different or any better or yeah? That's a good question. And I've thought about that. Um, I wouldn't necessarily say that the change has been dramatic. Um, cause you know, a lot of people will, they're looking for a change. Like they're looking for these dramatic things. And, and for some people it does, like I, I had dramatic change when I first went raw. So I can only imagine what my microbiome score was like before I went raw, like, you know, could have been in the low sixties or the high fifties. Like, I don't know. I wish they had testing back then. Cause I would have loved to know, um, how far my gut's gone since going raw. But since changing, like I felt 83 was actually a pretty good score at the time. I was like, oh, that's, that's pretty high. You know, when the average, uh, at the time the average was like 62%, according to the testing company, they're like, most people are around 62%. So I was like 83, that's pretty good. (laughs) Um, but I think we always look for these like intense reactions, like, oh, what was the big change? And for myself, you know, maybe there was maybe a little bit improvement in digestion because I already had great digestion. I didn't really necessarily notice a huge improvement there because it was already really awesome. Um, My skin's always been really good uh, and that's affected by the microbiome as well. Mood too can be affected by uh, gut health. And so I didn't necessarily notice a huge difference when it came to that, but I also know that not everything has a a noticeable improvement. What I believe is that what I'm doing for my microbiome is increasing my life quality and quantity potentially over the years and decades. So it's kind of like, where would I be had I not done that? And like, I like to look back on like, what if I didn't change 
um, and add more variety? Where would my gut be today? Right? It would it be worse? Would it be fine? Would it be what would it be? Right? And we'll never know that kind of stuff going back and, and thinking like, Oh, if I never changed, what would it be like? I mean, we can imagine for sure. Um, but yeah, I wouldn't say there was like a huge difference, but what I know is that I'm taking steps to keep myself healthy, um, through the years. And I already feel su super amazing. I just want to do anything that I can that is fun, obviously like no stress over it, but I enjoy, um, doing the variety and I, I just, my gut is like a gut of steel. Like I can digest any combination of food, all kinds of stuff, <laughs> like lots of variety. And you know, it's, it's a lot, it has a lot to do with the chewing, making sure we chew our food, slow down when we're eating, you know, the mechanics of, of digestion. So you can eat the most perfect diet in the entire world or the most perfect food. And if you are not chewing it thoroughly, if you're talking a lot during eating, if you're drinking a lot of liquids during eating, if you sit for like four hours after eating and you ate really fast or you're stressed out while you're eating, it doesn't matter what the food is. It's going to feel like a rock in your stomach if you don't like get up and move after or slow down. So the mechanics of digestion, I feel like are not as um, discussed necessarily. Like I do hear some people talk about it because they're so focused on the food. It's like, eat this perfect food. But if you're not chewing it properly and, you know, doing the mechanics of digestion, then, you know, it, it doesn't always feel that great. <laughs> mm. Yeah. hundred percent. And combining your food. Well, yeah, there's just so many aspects, like you said, um, mm -hmm. oftentimes people fixate on just one aspect, but yeah, I like yeah. to think of health as like a whole kind of flywheel. Exactly. But, um, I, I appreciate you. You've made like hundreds of videos on like what you eat in a day. But if anyone's just hearing you for the first time, what what's like a typical day, just like a general structure of eating or yeah, yeah. foods? So what we like, like our favorite days um, would look like we wake up, we drink a liter of water first thing in the morning. <laughs> we try to get that in. Um, then we like to have like two to 400 calories of fresh fruit first thing in the morning. Like we'll just go in the kitchen, stand around and eat mangoes or bananas or whatever we have available. Um, just as like to another way to get more calories in is to start earlier. So we like to start as early as we can. It doesn't happen every day, but most days we try to get some whole fruit first thing. And then ideally we like to go for our walk first thing. We'll go for an hour or an hour and a half walk. And then we come home and have a smoothie. So we'll blend up like either a fruit smoothie or we really like a banana date cacao smoothie. That's one of my favorites personally. Um, and then that's usually, if I could guess a, an average time, it's like around 930, give or take. That's usually when we have our smoothie. So before lunch, we've consumed anywhere from 800 to sometimes over 1,000 calories worth of fruit first thing in the morning. Then the rest of the day is mostly like on, again, the ideal days is like two salads or a salad and a raw creation. So if we're writing, working on recipes, we're going to have the recipes to eat. Um, and usually we have a big giant salad, uh, and they're, they're really big salads. Like when people, even people who are into a raw diet, when they see our salads, they're like, Whoa, <laughs> because you have to eat more calories on a raw diet because it's low in calorie density. So, you know, I always believe when you move over to a raw diet, you can throw out those diet culture ideas of like portion controlling and, um, and calorie restricting and all of that because you need to eat more calories on a raw diet. So it's okay to eat more fruit. It's okay to eat more vegetables. And it's, it's really ideal to eat a huge amount so that you get adequate calories. So one of our, sal one of our meals will be a big giant salad and the other might be a wrap or a burger or tostadas or, you know, any kind of fun raw food. We've got soups. We've got other really fun sushi is a really fun one that we like to make a lot. Um, but yeah, so that's kind of typically the day. And if we are kind of hungry in between meals, we'll just, I'll, I like to go in the kitchen and eat cherry tomatoes or grab a couple bananas or something like that. If I feel I need something or an apple, um, I really need to eat more apples, but, <laughs> um, yeah, that's kind of a typical day. I usually eat around 2,400 calories and that is roughly the amount of fats that we eat is around 10 to 15% on most days. Sometimes it's more, sometimes less, but, um, 
yeah, that's usually kind of average, an average day. Mm. Mm. Yeah, awesome. And in terms of fat, obviously, like you alluded to earlier at the um, beginning of your journey, like there was a lot of high mm. fat culture and yeah, that kind of approach. How how do you personally feel about fat? Like what's, um, yeah, what's, what's your approach? Obviously you said 10 to 15%. But mm -hmm. what would you say is like maybe the upper limit or, or what kind of problems come with like high fat? Mm. That's a great question. So there's a reason why we are oil free. So we don't do any oils because they're 100 percent fat. There's no fiber and they add your fat percentage up very quickly. So we don't use oils. And I would say, you know, it really depends on the person and your athletic level, your age, um, your needs. But I would say average, you know, 8% is on the lowest, lowest end. Like I wouldn't go below 8%. And it should really only be for like, if you're going to do that, like a random day here or there. Like, I don't think that doing low fat long term, like low fat under 10% long term is ideal. Um, and then upwards of like, I would say pushing it like 20%. That's kind of like on the higher end for a low fat diet. Now in society, a low fat diet is considered 30%, 30 to 40 or something like that. And the average person's eating 40 to 60 and high fats over 60. So it's like, dang, <laughs> like that's a lot of fat considered for a low fat diet. Um, so, but in the raw community, the low fat is usually 10%. And that was, you know, from Doug Graham. And I think that the 10% is ideal. I, I really enjoy 10%, 10 to 15%. You know, when I'm more active, um, or like using more calories, for example, or even in the winter months for some people, some people need that little extra fat, or if they need to gain a little extra weight, sometimes adding a couple percentage of fat in there. But the thing is, when you start to go over 20%, you start to add oils, you're adding, you know, you're eating really high fat, tons of avocados and that kind of thing. The extra amount of fats, especially saturated fats from animal products, but it can happen with plant fats as well, through experience, is that it can help, uh, prevent insulin from doing its job. So I like to show, you know, you've got your cell and your cell has a little uh, keyhole kind of for a, for a key on your cell. And we're, this is just an analogy, but this is kind of how it works. Your cell wants sugar. It runs on sugar. So carbohydrates from fruits and vegetables, sprouts, all of that. When we eat something, there's uh, sugar in our intestines that is released into our bloodstream and obviously processed sugar is released really fast so we don't want that but whole fibers and whole foods are released slowly into the bloodstream once it gets into the bloodstream the brain says hey there's sugar in the bloodstream we need to get it from the blood into the cell so we're going to use insulin insulin has the key to unlock the cell so insulin comes it unlocks the cell and it escorts sugar into the cell and the cell burns it for energy and all is good with the world. However, when we're consuming high fat, the fat kind of makes a coating and like gums up that keyhole. So when insulin comes to open the cell, it's like, my key's not working. I can't open the cell. So the sugar stays in the bloodstream. The body is like, hello, like, let's get the sugar out. And insulin's like, I can't, the fat's in the way. And so the sugar is still in the bloodstream the brain sends more insulin. And so then you become insulin resistant and your cells just aren't able to get the sugar. And that's where people get like the 3 PM crash or after they eat really high fat meals, they're super lethargic because their cells just aren't getting that energy that we need. So the goal is to lower the fat. So your insulin becomes sensitive. And then when you do eat fruit and carbohydrates from the greens and vegetables, you can use that sugar properly and effectively. So then you have more energy, you feel a lot better and you don't have that fat blocking. Now I want to also say that fat is essential. We need to consume fats to have the proper cell wall. So each of our cells has a phospholipid layer made from fats, specifically from the soft, more pliable, flexible fats, which are omega threes. So most people are eating way too high omega-6. I think the average is like 15 to 20 to 1, um, like 20 to 1, omega-6 to 3. They're not getting enough omega-3s in, so they default to fish oils. Um, and as a vegan, we don't do fish oils. 
We prefer to get our omega-3 from plant sources like chia and flax are the top two sources. Uh, basil seeds also have some omega-3, which can be a replacement for chia if people have allergic reactions to chia. Some people feel better with basil seeds, which you can buy as well. Um, then there's hemp and walnut, and they do have omega-3, but it's you know, it's not as high as chia and flax. Those are like the top two for omega-3, but you can also get omega-3 in your greens. Uh, one whole 630 gram head, which is really big, <laughs> a really big head of romaine lettuce has upwards of 75% of your RDA of omega-3. So your greens, your berries, um, some vegetables have little amounts of omega-3 in them as well. So that can help to increase, but having some chia and flax and focusing on those. So focusing more on the omega-3 uh, sources and a little less on the omega-6, which are the tasty ones. I mean, let's be honest, like cashews and almonds and, you know, all the other fats are higher, especially peanuts are probably one of the higher ratios of omega-6 to 3. So it's really easy to eat those fats. It's a little harder to want to eat the chia and the flax. We, you know, hide it in dressings and use it to gel things up or have chia pudding, for example. But again, we want to keep it in appropriate amounts for the human body. So around the 10 to 15% range, but also making sure that we have a good balance of omega-3 to 6 because there's only one family of enzymes that converts omega-3 into EPA and DHA and also converts omega-6 into his, its constituents as well. And omega-6 is more pro-inflammatory. Omega-3 is more anti-inflammatory. So, you know, the consensus in the natural health world when I was working in the, in the health industry was that you can't convert it from plants. You have to take the fish oil. So I believed that we needed fish oil. And I was like, no, you, you know, if you eat chia, it's not going to work or whatever. But it does. It does. That's like, it's kind of like a myth that people believe that we can't convert plants. The thing is, because there's only one family of enzymes that do this, if you have 20 to 1 omega-6, this enzyme is going to be too busy working on the omega-6 and there's not going to be very much left for the omega-3s. Whereas if you eat the appropriate balance, which is 1 to 1, omega-6 to 3, or up to 4 to 1, omega-3 to 6 to 3, <laughs> or like this, actually, sorry. Yeah, it's 1 to 1, so equal amounts of omega-6 to 3, or up to about 4 to 1, omega-6 to 3. This is the ideal ratio for humans, because then the enzyme can work on both, and it's not overburdened by the huge amount of omega-6 that we consume. And then you can actually convert omega-3 into EPA and DHA, which are the things that we need from the omega-3. So another long answer for you, but <laughs> yeah. Definitely, yeah, it's spot on. Um, I agree 100%. And have you found like super low fat? I don't know, maybe under that 8% mm -hmm. that you said is like potentially problematic just from mm -hmm. what you've observed? Yes, yes, definitely. From what I've observed from the people I've spoken with, this can cause a lot of issues with people, specifically skin issues, brain function. Um, and, you know, it's necessary for every single cell of our body. So like I said, we want that like pliable um, phospholipid layer. And omega-6 and saturated fats are very hard fats. So they make our cells very rigid. But omega-3 and omega or EPA and DHA omega-3 actually makes them more pliable. So things can come in and out like they should. Whereas with the other fats, it can make it more rigid. So if we aren't getting any fats though, our cell walls are kind of like not formed properly because there's just not enough of them. And if we have all these cells in our bodies, it really goes to show how much we should be valuing consuming some fats. And I like to use the word appropriate because I don't want to have people eat no fat, but I also don't want to see people eating super high fat. But we have found that over observation that the best way to have the best insulin um, sensitivity, the best energy levels, the best skin health is around the 10 to 15% range. Again, depending on your activity level and your age and all of that kind of stuff, you might want to adjust and see how you feel. If you feel great at 15% and you feel more satiated, um, 
or, you know, you just need that extra 15%, you just feel better, um, then go with 15%. If you feel better at 10%, do 10%. But I wouldn't recommend doing under 10% for long periods of time, maybe a day or here, you, you know, you just, you just feel like mostly fruit all day and you have like a date based dressing on your salad, but just for like a day or two or something. And then you, you know, start to add a little bit of fats in again, focusing on omega three rich sources, um, should be good. But yeah, I do see a lot of people with issues because of low fat, especially some people, um, have gallbladder issues. If they go no fat for too long, it's like the gallbladder is like, what am I going to do with all this bile and stuff? Right. (laughs) So, um, it can get backed up and that's why some people, um, I've heard will add olive oil or something to their juices. Um, because they're just, their, their gallbladder starts to hurt because they're, it's just getting backed up because there's no fat in the diet. So it's really important to have fats in a balanced way. Um, but again, that's just, you know, something I've heard. I don't know how uh, much weight goes into that, but some people have noticed that as well. So, mm-hmm. mm. yeah. Yeah. And just a final thing on like the topic of fat, how do you feel about, um, coconut, like mature coconut? Mm. Cause obviously there's yeah. saturated fat in that. Yeah. yeah, there is some saturated fat in that for sure. And we do use coconut, um, but it's not, you know, an often thing. I would say maybe a couple times a month we'll have the coconut, uh, but we prefer the young coconut. So, you know, when you get the the white ones, um, that meat inside is really soft and it's a lot lower fat than the mature coconut. So the mature coconuts roughly around 70 to 80% fats, whereas the young coconuts around 30 to 35% fats. So it's a lot lower in fat. It's a much better option if you want to add coconut. And like I said, we do use it here and there in certain recipes to get specific textures, to get specific flavors. Um, And we do use mature coconut here and there as well, um, but it's not often. We'll just use it you know, for specific, if we want a specific flavor, we'll use like a tablespoon or two of shredded coconut that's unsweetened, um, in something, but it really isn't like a huge part of our diet. So yeah, it's more just for the texture and, and the flavor, but yeah, too much of it can definitely, um, boost your cholesterol in, for some people Mm -hmm. who are on a raw diet, if they notice their cholesterol might be high, check your coconut meat intake. Cause if it's high, then you might, be adding to that so <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. yeah yeah a little seems to go a long way with, with it does. fat really <laughs> yeah. yes exactly yeah. yeah yeah and if you're if you want we'll tackle some um some like i'm just thinking some common problems people have like the mm. first one that comes to mind is like cravings um yes. especially emotionally a lot of people mm-hmm. say like they feel like they're emotionally eating do you have any tips for like cravings and yeah emotional eating mm-hmm. as well Yeah. One of my favorite topics. I love talking about this. Um, so a craving, let's just, uh, kind of differentiate between hunger and a craving. So hunger is a natural body signal that our body gives us to say, Hey, I need fuel. A craving is a symptom of hunger and a craving is usually based on habit. So when you get that hunger signal, what do you usually eat when you're hungry? Is it pizza? Is it potato chips? Is it a donut? Is it ch- uh, takeout food? Is it well, like, what is it? What is it that you're craving? Usually you're going to crave what you habitually choose when you're hungry. And in the diet culture world, they talk a lot about if you have a, if you have a craving for something, ignore it, distract yourself wait 20 minutes and see if you want it again later. And if you do go ahead and eat it or whatever, however, call a friend, go for a walk. All of this advice is postponing the root, which is you're hungry. Your body is sending a signal that says, Hey, I need fuel. The craving is just a manifestation of that. And again, what you crave is going to be based on habit or environment. So if you know, you're around friends and you haven't eaten, You know, you're going to crave what they're eating. Uh, They're going to push it on you maybe. And you're going to be like, yeah, maybe, you know. So uh, comfort is also another one. But that usually uh, can also stem from 
the fact that you're just hungry. And the number one issue that I've seen over the last decade when helping people to move over to a raw diet, the number one problem is that they're just not eating enough. And if you're not eating enough over time, over days, weeks, months even, your cravings are gonna get really intense because you're just not fueling your body with enough. And now we have an online community right now called Raw Food Romance, and it's an awesome group of people. And the people in there are starting to eat more because they come in there like, how do I do this? What do I eat? And we're like, eat this big salad. So I'll have a recipe for like one of our salads, which is a lot of food, right? And we have people in there who are like, I'm actually never hungry. Like I'm, I'm, my cravings are going away and it's not that the cravings go away necessarily. People always ask me, they're like, when do the cravings go away? I'm like, well, cravings themselves never go away because it's a manifestation of hunger, but your cravings can change with time. When you change your habits, when you change what you choose, when you are hungry over time and over practice, you know, we get good at what we practice. So the more often we make these positive choices, the more our cravings can change. So then we're like, oh, I'm hungry. I'm really craving mangoes right now. Oh, I'm hungry. I, I'm, I'm savory. I, I really want a big salad, right? So our cravings do change, but it takes time and we need to be patient with ourselves and we need to keep making those choices to reinforce the new habits. So the cravings never go away. They just change, but you can quiet them down by eating food. So if you have a craving, I always say, if you have a craving for anything, it doesn't matter what it is, just say to yourself, I'm hungry, I need to fuel. And then go in the kitchen, grab some bananas, make a smoothie, make a salad, whatever you're feeling. Um, if you're feeling sweet, if you want like candy bars or candy or what have you, eat fruit. If you're in, into chips or pizza or something savory, have a salad. That's kind of a typical way to go. Sweet, have fruit. Savory, have salad. So if you're feeling like, oh yeah, I just want a big bag of potato chips or whatever, go in there and make a salad. That's your solution. Because again, your body is just asking for fuel and that's really all it wants. And it's going to ask you for what it knows it's going to get. <laughs> like, it's like, oh yeah, I know she's going to go out for pizza or I know he's going to go buy that, you know, whatever junky treat that he enjoys. And then I will get my fuel, even though it's not the fuel that it needs, it knows you're going to give it to it. So, um, the cravings thing is a reward cycle as well. Like we're reward driven creatures. We choose based on rewards, not necessarily consequences. We know how we're going to feel if we eat a really fatty, junky meal. We already know that. And that's not a big enough deterrent for most people. Some people it works. They're like, I just don't want to feel like that. I'd rather feel this way. So I'm going to eat this. But for most people, the consequences aren't strong enough because the reward of having the pizza is really strong. The flavor, the convenience, your friends are doing it, tastes good. Like these rewards are way more powerful than the consequences. So then we eat it to get those rewards. And then we're like, why did I do that? Because, you know, like the consequences just aren't strong enough as a deterrent. So because we're reward, reward driven creatures, we want to choose something that has better rewards than the pizza does. So if we can focus on the rewards of eating something healthy. And this is something that most people don't think about when they have a craving is to think of the rewards of like, when you have a salad or when you make a smoothie or when you have a big bowl of fruit, how do you feel about yourself? Not just how you feel in your body, but how do you feel about yourself? Do you feel proud? Do you feel empowered? Do you feel like you're on track? Do you feel um, like, what do you feel? And I usually ask people like name five things you feel about yourself, not physically, just about you for the making that choice. What do you feel? And people are like, oh, I never thought about that because the feeling of being proud of yourself, the feeling of being empowered, the feeling of being in control of your food choices is a very powerful reward. And when you think, and when you start to feel those things, you're like, I actually want that. I want to feel in control. I want to feel like I am empowered and I can make this choice and I am strong enough. And all of these positive results of having a positive choice really helps us to guide over to making the positive choice instead of being like, instead of thinking the negative things of a negative choice, think the positive things of a positive choice. And it's like so much easier to move into that direction. Mm. Mm. 
hundred percent. And how long have you typically seen it takes to like build these habits, like uh, a positive Ooh. habit? That's a great question. I get that asked that a lot too. It's not time that is the determining factor here. Like, cause I can't give a window it's repetition. The more you repeat the habit, the stronger the habit gets. So you can have two people, you can have person a who chooses raw maybe once or twice a day. Um, and they do that for three months. You have person B who chooses raw two to three to four times a day. And they do that for three months. Person B is going to have a much stronger habit than person a, even though they went the same time, they both went three months. Person B has more repetitions of that choice. So their habit is going to be a lot stronger than person A. So it's not time, it's repetition. Because you know, a lot of people say like, oh, 90 days, you're going to have a habit or whatever. And you know, I, I do see the value in that. But if you don't keep up the habit, it's going to disappear because, you know, we've done things too. We're like, oh, you'll do a challenge for 90 days or I'll do, you know, workouts for 90 days. And then after 90 days, you stop because, you know, you're done the 90 days and then you don't continue it. The habit disappears. Like it doesn't magically stick around. Like you have to continue making the choices. It just gets easier. I would say it just gets easier and easier and easier. The more you repeat the habit, then it, and then it becomes kind of more of your reality. And you know, you might miss a day here or there. Like if you're doing, um, a walk every morning, it becomes a habit, but some mornings you might not have it and you might feel like you miss it because it is, it is becoming a habit, but if you miss it too many times, then the habit falls away. So we really have to make sure that even though we are creating habits, we have to stick with them <laughs> to make sure they stick. Hmm. hundred percent. Mm -hmm. Um, and yeah, no, another, um, like, I guess potential thing I hear is like socializing people Ooh. say like, I would stick to it, but like, I want to eat out mm -hmm. with friends or I want to, yeah, be social. How, how have you found it? Um, socializing? Yeah, that's such a tough one because we can only control our own choices. Um, and everyone else is going to do what, whatever they're going to do. And it's hard when we make a choice to change our life for the better. I find it fascinating how the people who are supposed to love and support us the most are the ones that are the harshest, the most judgmental, um, the most, you know, exclusive. They don't include you as much um, because you're making changes. And the thing is, it's because they are scared. It's not you or your choices. They're scared of you changing and being different and it's not going to be the same and that's out of their control. So they feel like they're not in control of your relationship together. They're like, Oh, are you going to disappear? You're going to go away. You're going to change too much. You're going to start judging me. And usually when people say like, Oh, you're judging me. It's like, well, I'm not judging you at all. You are judging yourself and you're projecting that onto me and assuming that I'm judging you. I'm not at all. I'm just doing this because it's right for me. Um, but when you see my salad, and then you see your plate of hot wings, that's a mirror. And then, you know, the person might be, get defensive. They might get offensive. Um, they might start joking. Like we all have these kind of default um, coping mechanisms when we're faced with someone else's change, right? Like we see someone else exercising every day and you're like, I should really be doing that, right? Um, and, and it, it stirs up stuff in, within us because we might want to change or we might not want to change. Some people are scared because they feel like they're going to have to change too and they don't want to or they're not ready. So then they start to, you know, lash out or bully you or debate you on every single topic or what have you. So it is really challenging. This is probably one of the harder things about going raw because eating enough, eating low fat, eating a variety of foods, making some fun stuff and enjoying, you know, the health benefits. That's all the easy part. The hard part is dealing with the rest of um, our friends and family and society in general. So when I first went raw, I noticed that one of the most disarming um, phrases that I could say to somebody was, I'm just trying to eat healthier. Instead of telling them I'm a raw vegan, because both those words can be very scary. Like, again, it's a mirror to, it's a reflective mirror. And they are like, oh, raw vegan. Oh, I could never do that. I don't want to do that. I like my meat and blah, blah, blah. Like they come up with these defense mechanisms. But 
what I noticed, and this is so helpful for so many people, is to say, all you have to say is, I'm just trying to eat healthier. You don't have to say you're vegan. You don't have to say you're raw. They're going to see a salad and they're going to be like, you know, I need to do that too. Yeah, because it's kind of universal. We all know we should be eating a little healthier. You don't need to go into detail and you can just say like, you know, I'm just trying to eat healthier. So I just wanted to bring my salad to this family event um, because, you know, that's just what I'm feeling. So you guys go ahead. Uh, I'm just going to eat this or whatever. Just trying to eat healthier. That's all you need to say. Because as soon as you say vegan, you're going to get people, you know, some people are genuinely curious. They might, you know, continue to probe and be like, oh, you're vegan. I want to go vegan too. And that's when you can open the conversation to that. But, you know, if it's typically people who are, you know, pretty intense or you're, you don't know them yet and you're kind of like, I don't really want to get into it because I don't know their beliefs, just say you're trying to eat healthier. Um, and that can really disarm a lot of people. And then just do your thing. Do your thing. You're doing it for yourself. I had um, partners in the past, like my partner before Nate. Uh, I was with him for about a year and a half. He was not vegan. He was not raw. He ate all the junk food. He drank a lot. He was really not on the same. He wasn't even in the same book as me when it came to that. He still, he'd eat a little couple bites of my stuff. Maybe you have a cup of salad or whatever, but I did it for me. And I told him straight out, I was like, there is no chance, no way, no how that I will ever consume cooked food. So if you ever ask, I'm going to say no. Just be aware of that because I know you're probably going to ask. So I just want you to know that I'm just going to say no. And it has nothing to do with you. It's just my own personal choice. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't want to consume that. So if it's cool with you, then yeah, we can date. You know, so I, I did tell him that at the beginning. But um, really communicating with people. Uh, that's really helpful to communicate in a loving way and reassure them because most people, when they see you're changing, they feel like you're going to leave or they're going to have to change or whatever I mentioned earlier, but they feel abandoned. Like you have to go to the root. Like why are they, what are they feeling really deep down? Most people are feeling potentially abandoned, potentially rejected, potentially unloved potentially judged. These are all human things um, that, you know, in our, in our ancestry, getting kicked out of the tribe was death, basically. So, you know, you wanted to put, play your part and all this stuff. So the feeling of rejection, the feeling of being left out, the feeling of someone else changing and you're not catching up, like FOMO, that kind of thing, can actually, are actually the roots of why people might lash out, might bully you, might make jokes, might debate you, all this stuff, because they're trying to defend themselves from feeling these deep feelings that they're feeling in the face of your choice. So always remember that it's so much more than what they say or how they react to it. It's more what they're feeling deep down inside. So if it's rejection, like if you say no to their um, cooked food dish with animal products in it, they're going to feel rejected. So you compensate by saying like, oh, you know, thank you for letting me stay here. Your hospitality is amazing. Like try to emphasize certain things that don't make them feel rejected. If they feel unloved, tell them how amazing you, they are. Tell them how much you appreciate their relationship. If they're feeling abandoned, maybe say like, thank you so much for hanging out with me. I'm going to call you next week. I really love being around you. Like you have to find these like roots of why they might be feeling this and then compensate with other things that have nothing to do with food. So that's what I would say on the social aspect. Mm. Yeah, hundred yeah. percent. I've, I've found it valuable to like shift it away from food as well. Yes. Just because there's so much more. Mm. Like food is great. Like it's it's tribal. We've bonded over food for years. But at the end of the day, like you said, there's so much more. And if you mm -hmm. if you shift the the subject to like, oh yeah, I'm really intrigued. Like, how have you been? Or just like most people, they never even get asked like deep questions. Yeah. So yeah, I think it's really good. Yeah, I like that you mentioned that too. Because um, like another thing is you just say, oh, yeah, I'm just trying to eat healthier, but I heard you had a new job. Tell me about that. Yeah. People love talking about themselves. They'd rather talk about themselves than defend their diet choices. So Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 100%. Yeah, I've just got one um, more quick question before the yeah, sure. rapid fire questions. Um, oh. Just about your, <laughs> your personal approach to supplementation. Oh. Um, and yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Supplementation. So 
I feel that supplements can be very beneficial for people who are deficient in certain things. And I do highly encourage people, if they want to know what's going on in their body, to get a test done. Again, it's not like some, a crutch or, you know, you don't have to be scared or avoid it because, you know, you think that you're all healthy, right? I, I don't want to assume that things are okay in my body. I want to know. I want to know that what I'm doing is right and working for me. So testing is really important. Just get a simple blood test. You can see your B12, your vitamin D levels, get a microbiome test, see how your gut's going. You can get omega tests from Omega Quant. Uh, I don't know if they ship worldwide, but um, like a microbiome test in the UK is uh, biomesite, S-I-G-H-T dot com, and they do um, over in Europe. So there's that as well. Um, you can even do at-home hormone testing now. There are some companies that are doing that. Uh, so if you want to test, I do recommend it if you're curious about where you're at, and then you can see what level you're at and see if supplementation is necessary. So usually if you're eating a whole raw food, plant-based diet, and you're eating adequate calories, you're eating enough, you're getting a good variety of things in, usually your bases are covered. But if you want to make sure, just get a test and see. And if you're low in B12 or D or whatever it is, then take a supplement. Um, always recommend, obviously, vegan supplements. Um, you know, there's some people who have genetic issues and they can't methylate certain things too, right? So there's that to consider as well. Most people don't even realize that they might have that um, genetic mutation, not able to methylate. So, you know, you can get tests for that to see if you have issues and maybe you need to take a different type of supplement to be able to um, methylate, for example. But, you know, Nate and I don't really supplement like we do. Um, in the earlier days, I would take a B12 most days. Um, but, you know, over the years, we forget. We don't take it. And, you know, like sometimes we'll do like, oh, yeah, we haven't taken a B12 in how many weeks? You know, so we'll take a B12. Um, you know, just over the years, we've kind of not really done that. But because we've also taken tests and our B12 is, mine is actually like above mid-range. Um, so I'm not. I'm not worried about my B12, but again, I want to test. So, you know, every two years or whatever, I'll do a, a, a test and just to see if it gets a little low, then maybe I might start supplementing a little bit. Um, but for right now, I don't really take a lot of supplements to spend a lot of time outside in the sun to make vitamin D. But unfortunately, like depending on where you live, like, you know, the Northern countries, even if you spend time in the sun, you're not necessarily making the amount of vitamin D that you would if you were living in the tropical areas or closer to the equator. So that comes into play too. Like you could be spending a lot of time in the sun and still be deficient in vitamin D because you're just not making it or you're not absorbing it. Uh, because after your skin is, um, after the sun touches your skin and you start making the vitamin D, if you wash it off or take a shower after you've been outside right away, you can wash some of that vitamin D because it's actually a hormone. Uh, it's not really a vitamin. It's actually a hormone that is created when your skin touches sunlight. So that hormone needs to be absorbed, and it takes a couple hours to do that. So don't shower right after you've been out in the sun. Um, but if you want to take a supplement, by all means, do that if that makes you feel comfortable. But again, get testing so you, you know for sure if you need it or not. Because if you don't need it, there's no point in taking it. Um, it, it might maintain your levels if you take a supplement. But again, if you're testing and year after year, you're fine because you get sun, because you're eating, you know, you're getting enough B12 from soil and being out in nature and all that kind of stuff. Like you don't necessarily need to take it unless you need it. So those are my thoughts. <laughs> mm, awesome. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And if you're feeling great, I think that's probably a good indicator as well. Yeah. Uh, right. Totally. So I'll just Pull up the rapid fire questions. Ooh, and Nate told me about this. I'm like, oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> he didn't tell so, me yeah. like a lot. I was like, okay, I'm gonna. Ooh, okay. <laughs> so yeah, just obviously as fast as you as you can. But if you need okay. to elaborate, um, feel free. Okay. Okay. Uh, describe yourself in one word. Oh man. <laughs> the first word that came to mind is creative. Nice. <laughs> What is one book that everyone needs to read? Oh, man. Mindful Self-Discipline. I can't remember the author's name, though. 
That's so good. I'll Giovanni Den Densman, I think. I don't remember, but yeah. Mindful Self-Discipline. Amazing book. Awesome. Yeah, it sounds good. I'll look it up after. Um, <laughs> what's the best piece of advice that you've ever received? Listen to people. Don't always share your opinion. Validate them. Listen to them. Let them talk. And do not offer advice unless they ask for it. Mm. Yeah, it's I very, it's very helpful. It's, <laughs> it's changed my relationships. Seriously. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, I like that. What are three things that you can't live without? <laughs> my cats, my husband. <laughs> Actually, it should be my husband first. <laughs> um, I just saw my cat right off the bat. Uh, so I said him first. But my cats, my husband, um, and hiking out in nature. Mm. Amazing. And raw What's food. I mean, there's so many things. Gosh. <laughs> Mm. <laughs> what's your greatest strength and what's your biggest weakness oh I think they go one in the same my greatest strength is that I over deliver when it comes to content and sharing um, and I think that's also my greatest weakness because my life can be unbalanced because I give so much on social media like I don't think a lot of people realize how much work it is behind the scenes like sometimes I'm I'm working like 8 to 12 hours a day uh, replying to people and helping people like totally for free. And on top of that, there's video editing, there's video filming, there's ebook creation, there's recipe creation and all, all of that. It takes a lot of work behind the scenes. So yeah, biggest, <laughs> biggest strength is that I love to help and that I want to help, but it's also a weakness because my life gets unbalanced sometimes. Mm. <laughs> Yeah, I can totally get that. Mm -hmm. I guess that links into the next one, which is, do you believe in having a purpose? If so, what's your mm -hmm. purpose in life? Ah, yes. I believe purpose is one of the, you know, the wheel of health. The things that we need to have a healthy life is to have a purpose. And my purpose is to help people um, transition to enjoying more raw food, finding healing in their own way, and to have a safe place for people to explore it without having to feel like they have to go all in all at once or do anything extreme or restrictive. I really want to support people in wherever they are at. So that's my purpose and to create recipes. <laughs> awesome. uh, and finally, what are you grateful for today? Oh, I'm grateful for this interview. This has been really fun. Thank you so much for um, inviting me. I'm grateful for all the new people in our Raw Food Romance online community, the connection there. Uh, it's only about just over three weeks old now uh, as of this recording, and we've been having a blast in there. So I'm really grateful for all who have joined. Um, and I'm grateful for this bowl of mangoes. Ooh, let's show it here. This bowl of mangoes that Nate brought me. <laughs> oh. <laughs> so I'm very, very grateful because I'm going to devour that. <laughs> yeah, I'll let you go in just a second. But um, yeah, where can people, where can people find you? Where can they get in touch? And, yeah, yeah, so um, Raw Food Romance on Instagram. This is Raw Food Romance on Facebook and on YouTube. And the online community can be found at school.com by searching raw food romance. So if you go to skool.com, search raw food romance, you'll be able to find the community. Uh, we also have an online meal planning app at rawfoodromance.com. And if you go to Instagram um, or YouTube or any of our social media, our links to all our recipe books and all, all the stuff that we recommend and, you know, all, all the links, all the links are where links go. <laughs> Everyone knows where those are. So, um, yeah, just go there. And we also always have 40% off our recipe ebooks. So if anybody was interested in grabbing the wraps, the burgers, the tacos, appetizers, the salads, the meal plans, whatever. We've got like over 20 books now, nice creams. <laughs> um, the code is raw food 40. Just use that at checkout payhip.com slash raw food romance. <laughs> awesome. Sounds like you got a lot going on. I can see how you're working eight to 12 hours. <laughs> yes, yes, exactly. I'm like, oh my gosh, there's so much to do, but I love it. I mean, it's what I would do in my spare time. So, I mean, <laughs> exactly. yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you for your time and thank you for thank everyone you. who's listened this far. And yeah, wishing everyone a wonderful day. Peace and love, awesome. everyone.